Hey party people, welcome to another video. I've got my test model in front of me. It's a 2020 Volkswagen Passat white paint. Yes, clear coat. Shot a few videos on it. But one of the more commonly asked questions that I get is, Darren, can you polish plastic? Specifically because of my favorite polish, ceramics. Darren, can you use ceramics on plastic? Well, the simple answer is yes. And in case you have not seen my other videos, I actually make a comparison with the clear coat on your car is a form of plastic. At a rudimentary level, it is plastic, which is why I also use my acrylic disc. That's a type of plastic. But you may ask, well, what kind of plastic are we going to be discussing today? Tail lenses. Perfect test example. And here we have the ass end of the 2020 Volkswagen Passat plastic tail lenses. Let me bust out the scan grip and let's go in for a uh, perspective. So here on the ass end of the tail lens, you can see some skid marks, scratches, call what you want. Now what I want to also highlight is this thing called swirl marks. Now most people are familiar with swirl marks in paint, but swirl marks can display themselves just about anywhere. Now to clarify, swirl marks is the pattern created by reflected light. Now there's three things that need to come together to produce what most people call swirl marks. You need a scratched surface that's reflective. You need a light source and more precisely, you need a round light source because the reason people call them swirl marks is there is a swirled or circular pattern. Well, the, ref the light source itself, which in this case, the scan grip is a circular pattern, just like the sun. Most people will observe uh, swirl marks in the sun. The sun is a circle. Therefore, the way the light is scattered is in a circular pattern. So the scratches that you're seeing all over this tail lens are not actually circular in shape. They're just endless scratches that only reflect in a circular pattern due to a circular light source. I'm gonna first use uh, some tape to really isolate the tail lens. I'll fast forward this so you don't have to endure the agony. Of course, I can make a whole separate video like this. I really like this particular tape. Uh, it's put out by Scotch brand versus 3M or any other tape manufacturer because I can stretch it and really manipulate it. So like everything else in life, it's all about the details, which, you know what? Let me just talk through this because now this does have the limitations to it, like right there, as far as its malleability, stretchability. So you may ask why on, you may ask why on earth would you want to polish a plastic tail lens, Darren? Well, I don't know about you, but I really am into the details. It is said that God is in the details, the devil is in the details, but I say the difference is in the details and the answers are in the details. Now, you may say like, oh, like right in this moment, why would you spend that much time taping it off? Well, this is part of the details of high end paint correction, high-end detailing, whatever you want to call it. So I am being very precise in this moment. This is my first um, layer of protection. Now this comes off here, so this uh, body panel is set back, so I don't really need to worry about the uh, paint in that case. What I'm going to do here, because it gradually unites with the body panel right here. So I really don't have to worry about this section. So details. And the specific question, why would you want to polish the plastic lenses of a tail lens? Well, I would just simply default to why would you want to polish paint? If you like shiny paint, I'm going to guess you probably like shiny tail lenses. If you like defect-free paint, I'm going to guess that you might prefer 
defect-free tail lenses. Ergo, that's the question. Darren, can I use the polish to polish plastic? Once again, the comparison, and I, I believe at a chemical level, that it is a fair comparison to make between clear coat being a type of plastic and this plastic as a type of plastic. With the understanding that this is my axiom, which is nothing is created equal. Now, in doing some other videos on this white paint, I came to the conclusion really quickly that this is extremely hard clear coat on this paint. That will make or break your world. Specifically, if you are a beginner, it will be a rude awakening where you're working on hard clear coat, but as a beginner, you'll have nothing to compare it to. All you're gonna know is that, oh my gosh, I watched all these videos on YouTube and they made it look so easy and here I am trying to polish my paint or remove a scratch and nothing is happening. Well, you may have the misfortune of having a car with particularly hard clear coat. As much as I would love to call hype on that whole talk track of like, oh, hard clear coat versus soft clear coat, it is a valid point and it can be a massive determinant in your success, your frustration. But as a beginner, you'll have nothing to compare to. So in, in shooting some previous videos, I know, for example, that the plastic of this versus the plastic in the form of clear coat on this, this is way softer, this is way harder. So in this moment, if this was my first rodeo, I can make a comparison if I had learned like, oh yeah, when I do a high-end paint correction, I always make sure to polish the tail lenses. Because I know, for example, when I'm sitting at a, a stoplight and I'm behind the other cars and the sun is catching the uh, nuances of the car in front of me just right, I'm gonna scrutinize it. So if a car stands out that I can tell like, okay, someone is taking care of that car, it looks exceptionally clean. I'm going to go in and do a deep dive and scrutinize it and say, oh, but are the tail lenses polished or are they filled with uh, defects, swirl marks, whatever you want to call that. Officially, it's what I call wash scratch or spider webbing effect. Swirl marks in the professional world have to do with buffer tracks, specifically the use of a rotary polisher. And because I want complete protection, I'm going to come in some with some wider tape. Now this is just basic painter's tape. Yes, very effective as a prophylactic. It does not stretch like the green tape does. So this is where I'm gonna to have to use multiple pieces and kinda of do this. And literally this is what I do professionally if in fact I wanted to isolate this tail lens precisely. For example, let's say a customer called me and they have a deep gouge in just the plastic piece itself. They just want that taken care of. They're not trying to pay me to polish the paint or anything else. Then I'm going to isolate this so that I can work specifically on this without touching the surrounding areas. So there's many reasons that you may choose to apply tape. Now you may think that the overhang on this is a little extreme. Well, if you, if you'll understand once I attach the buffer to this because the buffer is, there's gonna be some overhang. Now let me come in with a uh, more traditional um, swirl finder. So I wanna show just the defects of this tail lens. So literally right there, right there, you can see some skid marks that do not belong. <laughs> That's not part of the original equipment moment. So what I'm gonna do is decide as I'm talking, I'm gonna section off. For example, here is a real good illustration of swirl marks. What is officially in the professional world called spider webbing, wash scratch, as in car washing, towel marks, um, but it's not officially 
swirl marks, but I understand the connection because they take on a circular pattern. I just want to highlight the before effect. Now to really bump up the jam, I'm going to take some 2500 grit sand paper to verify there. I'm not going to use a sanding block because I'm not trying to retain the precision or the control that a sanding block would allow me, which means that I don't have to maintain perfect flatness. There's no orange peel. There's no real texture to this like car paint. It's um, got a curvature, curvature to it. And really what I want to do is just dial this up. So what this is, is a representation of the endless types of damage that you can incur to a tail lens or paint or anywhere. Also, it will answer another question, which is, hey, Darren, can you wet sand plastic? Well, if the plastic is rigid enough, then yes. How would you tell the difference? Well, imagine trying to wet sand or sand first clear transparent film like they use on food that would just gum up the sandpaper it would not work so this is very hard very rigid plastic so it can be the sandpaper can bite into it and cut into it without gumming up the sandpaper hopefully that explanation makes somewhat sense and this is also why I taped off those areas is now that I can freely sand the area. And let me just talk a little bit because what I'm doing is I'm introducing 2,500 grit sanding marks. The goal of sandpaper, well, let me reduce it down to this one word, control. So sandpaper offers a level of control as far as refining the surface that a buffer with a traditional buffing pad does not allow for. Also, there's this much spread rumor. It's just misinformation. And I've referenced Chris Fix in the past because, you know, I'm sure Chris Fix is a terrific sort of dude. I don't know Chris Fix and I'm only choosing him because he has a massive channel so I'm pretty sure at this level he's developed a thick skin. So I'm not trying to disparage him I'm just saying is that he repeats bad information which is this never apply anything in a circular fashion because a it produces swirl marks well I clarified what swirl marks are and aren't at the beginning of this video Secondly, he says that swirl marks are harder to remove than straight scratches, which is just not true. The determining factors as to how easily or how hard scratches can be removed precisely have to do with the depth of the scratch itself. It doesn't matter what direction, it's the depth into the material as well as the material itself then it would just bleed out to the nuances of what type of buffer, what type of buffing pad, are you using a compound, a polish. So what I'm doing is I'm just sanding this to illustrate a few points. And what I will do at this point is now, uh, and, and part of the rule with wet sanding, and they call it wet sanding because, well, you use water. Why do you use water? because the water washes away the material as you abrade, scratch, sand it off. So it doesn't gum up the paper itself. So I'm gonna go in a circular pattern up here at the top because I know it's irrelevant because what I'm doing is I'm creating what's called a uniform scratch pattern. And what that means is it has nothing to do with the direction of the scratches it has to do with the depth of the scratches. So however deep the 2500 grit is, I'm sure it could be measured with the right tool, but it's irrelevant. I just know in this moment, 2500 grit is sand marks that I can deal with pretty easily. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a uniform scratch pattern so that every blemish in this uh, tail lens now once I continue to uh, develop that uniform scratch pattern, 
I know that the deepest defect will be 20, the equivalent of 2,500 grit. Hopefully that makes sense. For example, if I did not create a, a totally uniform scratch pattern and there's still some deep gouges in this and I go to buff it, well, guess what's gonna still remain once I'm done buffing and I'm removing the scratches that I don't want to be there? Well, there's still gonna be some deep uh, gouges. So it may not always be realistic to create a uniform scratch pattern, but ideally that is part of, or one of the many goals when it comes to sandpaper. So just to verify, I went back and forth, left and right down here, and I went in a circular pattern up here. I wanna make sure that I finesse this down here so that I've really uniformed scratch pattern. Now, one or two of you that are watching this may be wondering like, oh, Darren, does tell lenses have a clear coat on them? Like for example, the paint has a clear coat and generally, and pretty much in every case, they put a clear coat on the headlights. But I have yet to see a clear coat as far as factory, I've yet to see a clear coat on tell lenses. Why is that the case? I'm not really sure because headlight lenses are plastic. These are plastic. Why are they putting a clear coat on that? I can only speculate based on a few things, but the point is, is I've yet to come across a tail lens in my professional life that has a clear factory clear coat on it, which is mostly the good news, which means that unlike the car paint, I do not have to worry about burning through the clear coat. If I were to burn through the clear coat while sanding or polishing on the white paint, the area that gets burned through will change the tonality of the white, meaning the white will look different. So not only do you not want to burn through the clear coat because the clear coat is good, but it's going to change the color of it. There's no unringing that bell. So this, it's solid plastic. Unless you sat here and sanded for about a year, and more all the way through the thickness of this tail lens, you don't have to worry about the actual thickness of the clear coat. It's a little sidebar moment. So I think what I'll do is I will section, well, let me dry it off first. In case you're not picking up on it, one of the drawbacks of blue painter's tape um, is the fact that it's not very watertight. The green scotch tape, it's way more watertight. So sometimes if I'm doing wet sanding like this and things start to lift up, I may have to um, reapply, which maybe I'll do here, reapply some of that blue prophylactic tape because when it comes to sanding, or I'm sorry, because now this step is gonna be all about polishing. And I still want to really isolate the area. So let me just do a quick do over with this. Wipe up all the residual water. But I'm going to maximize the video moment and I'm going to show you polishing by hand. Now there's a natural character line right here on the tail lens that's molded into it. So this comes down and then this kind of drops down a little more sharply. So I'm going to section this off right at that character line. And I'm going to be polishing this by hand to show you. Yes, in fact, you can use any polish any compound by hand or with machine, regardless of what the directions say. So here is my favorite go-to polish for many, many reasons. Once again, you can use this by hand or machine. Now, many of you will default to hand because you don't want to buy a buffer and buffering pads and learn how to use a buffer because it's really, really scary and I get it. You're not looking for perfection, you're just looking for better results. So I'm gonna show you 2,500 grit sanding marks. Just as a heads up, is not considered overly aggressive in a world of wet sanding. So for example, when we are teaching people 
we're certifying them on this product, we will tell them to take sanding marks to 2,500 to 3,000 grit. Really 2,500, you can stop there. But if you're a beginner, because really the finer the grit of sanding marks, the easier everything moving forward will become. Microfiber cloth, I always recommend a microfiber cloth. There's my little dollop of polish. And what I wanna do is just isolate the bottom with the top. And I'm gonna show you how much effort and the results that you can, well, because most tail lenses are pretty uniform in how rigid they are, unlike clear coats. Clear coats, it's all over the board. How soft, how hard, it's much more diversity. So I think this would be a fair representation of most tail lenses on the market. Now this is a 2020 model. So it has not endured the elements of weather and sun exposure like maybe your 10 or 15 year old car does. So you're gonna to have to factor those things into the equation. So at this point, things are looking pretty shiny, but do not underestimate the power of lighting. My goal as a professional detailer is to make sure that I produce results that look uh, superior in direct sunlighting. But as a professional, I also know that different light sources will um, reveal different blemishes, different flaws, different uh, good things. It's not all negative, but light is critical. So I will verify with my customer, okay, do you want me to achieve perfection based on you looking at your car in direct sunlight? Pretty much every customer I've ever had says yes because I inform them that if they're gonna scrutinize their car under fluorescent lights in their garage, every time they go out into their garage to get another car, I said, you need to let me know. Um, generally, if I nail it in the sunlight, I know I've nailed it in the fluorescence. The difference would be LED lights and the different lumens. That's where things really can get tricky. So what that said is, Wow, that looks pretty cool. And by cool in this moment, I mean that the sanding marks are, as far as I can tell, disappeared. But what you're seeing, but what you're still seeing is what would be considered swirl marks. And that's one of the trade-offs of doing it by hand is trying to refine that surface finer and finer and finer, because what I'm looking to achieve is a highly refined reflective surface. And what that would mean in this moment would be that light source would be perfectly round and it would be not, and it would not be scattering the light and revealing those swirl marks. So what I will do is I'm gonna go back in for a deeper dive, apply some more polish, and I'm just gonna go back and forth and I'm putting my weight into this. Now you can use a backing plate for this even if you wanted. Like for example, here's a very rigid backing plate. It's made out of acrylic, but it's got a soft pad over here. So, you know, this is where industriousness comes in. So I could put some polish along here and now I, I can apply more pressure because this is a mostly flat surface. I'm not having to work or be constrained by nuances of body panels. So I can sit here and really lay into this at a much higher level than just with my hand. So now I have a backing plate, which you could then call this a buffing pad. Generally, when we think of pads, we think of something malleable and softer than this hard backing plate, but nonetheless, so if I was finessing this in the real world, I would go in really heavy handed with like, let's say I'm choosing the backing plate, but then to refine it, I'm going to back off the pressure and just finesse this back and forth. 
very light pressure, because what I want to do is finesse those scratches. And if you don't understand the, the physicalities of scratch removal, you literally are uh, sanding your way to perfection, sanding your way to success, because you're using the abrasive particles that are, sus that are suspended in your choice of slurry, a compound, polishing compound, polish, whatever it is, abrasive particles are suspended in that. At least this product has abrasive particles. Unfortunately, there's no standardization in this industry. Therefore, one manufacturer may call a polish that has zero abrasives in it. Another company may call a polish and it has abrasives in it. There's just no standardization. Let's go in for a deep dive. Got my lens. Let's see. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, baby. Woo. I'm liking the results. And this is produced by hand. Now, once again, if you're going to make a comparison with this plastic lens to the clear coat plastic, this would be considered very soft in relation to the very, very hard clear coat on that white paint. But as a beginner, you won't know the difference, but I am liking what I see. So let me pull back. Let me really try to scrutinize this the best as possible. Because once again, lighting, how many lumens you're using, how close the lighting is, uh, the angle in which you're uh, reflecting the lighting off and capturing it with your eye or camera, those are all determinants as to what is revealed. So let's take this off, this line of separation. Something very unique about this product, aside from the many attributes, but it's true waterborne technology. But even a deeper dive into that is that this has a surfactant uh, formulated into it. Now, a surfactant is just a glorified name for soap. And you may say like, wow, why the hell would I want soap in my polish, Darren? Well, it has to do with cleanup. Now, I don't recall what Tom Horvath, which is the formulator of that product, I don't remember if he discovered when he was um, engineering his specific formulation that the soap part of it was a byproduct, a natural byproduct, or if he did it specifically to aid in cleanup, which means the second you introduce water to it, it breaks it down. And so cleanup is super, super easy. It's like, oh, wow. And once again, if you're a beginner, you have nothing to compare that to. For example, solvent-based products, they gum up, they get sticky, they eventually plasticize, which means they become like rock-hard cement, and they are a nightmare to clean up. They can be. And cleanup is a big time suck for a lot of, well, in this world of polishing. Now we can come back in, get my light. Now we've got a nice refined circle and it's not um, dispersing or scattering all the light to creating that swirled mark effect. So can you polish plastic? Yes, you can. Can you wet sand plastic? Yes, you can. Can you do it by hand? Yes, you can. But if you're still tuned in, let me show you what we can accomplish in a much more efficient manner called using a buffer. What I will do is segregate this back off so that we can see you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover up an area of scratches. I'm not sure if that will be a good thing or a bad thing, as in your viewing pleasure. What, I'm, what I want to do is just keep this separate from the buffer. And this is where I'm going to have to 
um, tape it off even further because I know there's going to be some overlap. I really want to protect this area so we can do a direct comparison by hand machine. So here I have my Max Shine. After all, you love shine, we all love shine. Who doesn't love Max Shine? All right, so CSI, I'm going to season the pad very unceremoniously like that. I'm gonna dial this up to a five, pretty much every one of these buffers. And by those buffers, I'm referring to a dual action, meaning there's two movements. This pad spins and it actually oscillates in a circular pattern. So this pattern of that short little throw, that's where the throw comes in. This is what's considered a short throw, 15 millimeter throw. So it will, that is gear driven, but this part is free floating, which means if you apply enough pressure, downward pressure while you're polishing, this spinning will cease. The, the other um, movement will continue. And this, because this is not gear driven, that's why they call it random. So dual action, two movements, random orbital orbits, the center axis, but this is random because it randomly will stop based on pressure. But anyhow. literally just going to stop. That's what I, Darren Priest, calls two passes. Now the reason I stop so short is I want to see, really it's trying to illustrate a point of just how much more efficient. Now efficacy is different than efficiency. So am I able to produce effective results? So effectiveness has to do with the end results. The efficiency has to do with the process. So am I efficiently using time to deliver acceptable results? Hope that makes sense. So what I'm trying to illustrate is, okay, looking pretty damn good. Let me cast or try to capture. Okay, see, now, suddenly I can see a circular pattern very clearly, but I can also see there's still some defects in that lens. But that was two passes with the buffer and I produced those kind of results. So that's not me trying to talk you into a buffer. It's just that you need to understand the limitations of trying to do something by hand. There's plenty of bad stories I mean, honestly, the internet, social media of every kind, it's like a cesspool of bad information. Yes, that's a very cynical attitude and it's a massive oversimplification because here I am on social media. So that would then label me as part of that cesspool. I'm trying to be less sessy, which is not even a word, and more valid informational. Information that draws from over 30 years of professional experience. Now, just to clarify, when I say professional, that does not mean I get paid to instruct people, even though I do. What that means is that I have to answer to customers, customers that pay me their hard-earned money to produce desired results. So if I am unable to please enough customers, guess who goes out of business? Yes, I do. Or if I piss off enough customers, guess who also goes out of business? I do. So to me, there's no higher level of performance. So you could say like, oh, I've got a PhD because I took, a, well, first I got my uh, uh, associate's degree in detailing. Then I went on to get my uh, master's degree and then I got my PhD in detailing. It's like, okay, jack off sign. You know why? Because that is what's called book smarts. It's not real world smarts. 
So this is not me trying to float my own ego. I'm just saying is that there is a difference. When you've got to perform for paying customers and you have the ability to sustain business for 30 plus years, I think that's merits worthy of noting for you as the audience, which is verifying your source. Like, oh, is this guy actually just regurgitating bad information? Or is this guy actually speaking from real world experience? So I want you to make a distinction when I say real world experience or professional experience, what that means. So once again, I'm not trying to talk you into using a buffer. I'm just trying to highlight how much more efficient it is specifically. And then you could also argue how much more effective it is at producing results. Something else that is noteworthy is that I am using a single polish. I'm not transferring. I'm not going with a heavy duty compound. Then I transition into a, a medium level compound that I transition into a heavy duty polish. And then I transition into a, a fine polish. Okay. I'm not doing that. I'm using one product and one pad. So this pad is my chosen pad. Yes, we will begin selling this very shortly. And this is what I call the winning balance between performance with 90, I'm going to call it 98% of the cases. So is there 2% of the population that has a highly developed eye that can scrutinize things to a higher level? Yeah, but that's 2% of the equation. So if I know that I can operate with a single polish, one pad and nail 98% of the moments, that is a massive win in my world. So this is the industry's original single product polish, which means throw away all your multiple compounds and polishes. I don't know if you're picking that up. What you also might've picked up in the video is that I concentrated my efforts a little more tightly in these corners because when I came in for the first scrutiny, I noticed that there were some specific um, sandy marks still a little visible and I want to make sure that I nail those. So let's come in, do a little wipe and let's scrutinize this a little tighter. So it's really, I've got this uh, GoPro, it's got a very tiny LED lens, which is hard for me to make sure I'm capturing what I'm talking about. So right there up in that corner or that corner to your right, that's what I'm focusing on is right there, that very precise circular pattern of the light. So let's just, yeah, I'm happy with the results. One buffer, one polish, one pad. And I promise you from a distance, never mind up close and scrutinizing that, from a distance, most customers, as in 100% of any customer I've ever dealt with, would wet their pants and be like, wow, that looks phenomenal. I am so happy with those results. So let me cast a reflection. Those blue lights, by the way, are the LEDs on my workbench behind us. So let me just capture, because wow, I just love polishing the results, that, that beauty, the reflection, the depth, the shine, the gloss. It's like, oh, pretend for me or with me in a moment that this was black paint that I was polishing on. And I came in with that LED light and I scrutinized it at that level because officially this is really my default pad. We do make a fine finishing red pad that is softer that you would then transition. So let's say that was black and I'm still picking up some type of swirl mark pattern, spider webbing, whatever you want to call that micro marring, whatever. That's where you would change pads, but still use the same polish. That's a case by case. And there's a lot of moving factors to that. Like what type of clear coat are you working on? How hard is it? 
who your customer is, what you're getting paid, what level of perfection are you getting paid to achieve. So a lot of factors that go into that. Let me wet this with water and do a wipe down. Of course, I am, would be nice if I picked a microfiber that was a little more precise so that I don't introduce some scratches to my freshly polished area. First, no light. We'll come up close. So we've got a line of demarcation right there where my finger is. I'm gonna to try to capture it so we can see the sanding marks. Sanding marks right through there. So here we go, top, bottom, and I would say the bottom looks more refined compared to the top. But I'm willing to bet, unless there was a direct comparison like I'm doing in the moment, that, and I'm and I, not to overuse numbers, but I guarantee 98% of the world would look at that and say, damn, you nailed it, Darren. But then I'd say, well, wait, would you prefer that? Or would you prefer that? Now, based on their level of discernment with their eye that's either trained or untrained, they may not be able to see a difference. And then we've got the original sanding marks right through the middle. So let me go ahead and disrobe this tape for you um, for the big, big fur reveal. I'm just going to like tune up the edges a little bit, wipe this down. Yes, I still have the sanding marks left there which I will do for another video. Okay, party people, well, thanks for playing along. Leave your comments and questions below. Always check the links below because I will take you to one of my websites where I'll wax longer and stronger on any given subject today, like what do I consider the best car polish, um, car polishing for beginners, check out the links. And by the way, if you haven't given the video a thumbs up yet, I'm pretty certain I've taught you at least one nugget of wisdom. Give the video a thumbs up. I appreciate it. And by all means, leave a comment below. And if you truly have endured to this moment, the word for the day is shine. One word, shine. Separately, leave that in the comments below. Any additional comments or questions, leave that separately. Okay. Thanks for playing along and we'll see you in the next video.